Okay, I think we're ready to roll. Um, this morning, we'll talk about not just phytoplankton and krill, but also about the whole concept of the sinking of carbon, um, not just on the Southern Ocean floor, although we'll spend a good bit of time on that, but more importantly, for understanding this concept of carbon sequestration and capture. Or, um, carbon capture and sequestration, I'm sorry, CCS. Very popular term these days. Uh, but I think we ought to understand what nature is doing for us and particularly in the oceans. And so that's why I felt it appropriate to uh, open this up for further exploration today. So you can see the little blue arrow, arrows here, the vertical one at the end of Creole showing this cute little crustacean. Uh, they're about two and a half centimeters long and can be even a bit longer than that. Um, probably one of the, they say one of the most, uh, the largest biome or accumulated uh, um, animal matter on the planet is uh, in the form of krill. And the phytoplankton, of course, is also um, very large. And that phytoplankton means it's a type of plankton that's photosynthetic. So it has chlorophyll. And the phytoplankton provided uh, a lot of oxygen. Uh, most of the oxygen that we have, particular types of phytoplankton. And so it's important to understand where oxygen came from. So let's move on into those slides. And I will just check and see if there are any questions. If there are any, please uh, uh, we need to go back to stop screen share for a moment to see if there are questions. Please use the chat function, the Q&A. Um, you can raise a question for the group, but uh, uh, can only be seen by me. Um, whereas if you use the chat function, it uh, everyone can see it and I can read it out and we can all discuss it at that time. So I'll go back to sharing the screen and we'll move on to the other slides. Um, so uh, this is um, uh, the theme that I was presenting, nature already sequesters carbon for us. And most of us are familiar with this carbon cycle in the photograph here. To protect sequestering, we have to appreciate this cycle. We often think of carbon exchanges over land, which you can see here mostly. The numbers that you see are fluxes or uh, changes in gigatons of carbon per year. And you can see over on the um, far right here, of fossil fuels and cement production combined put out five and a half gigatons per year, a fairly large number. But you see these numbers here, 92 and 90, meaning the exchange between the sky and the air. So carbon dioxide is pretty well matched, um, coming in a little faster than it's leaving, but fairly well balanced between water masses and the atmosphere. And then you can see the marine biota here in various other things that we'll go into more detail later. From soils, you can see significant um, uh, CO2 um, release from soils, as well as from trees, and uh, uh, pretty well matched uh, here with uh, coming back into the, the trees itself. So uh, the Earth is, a, is an oceanic planet and it's all very well to be aware of what's going on um, over the earth, but we really need to think a little bit more about the oceans. So we'll look at it a little bit more, starting with the coastal systems. Kelp really takes up a lot of CO2 um, along the coastal regions, and it can have a plant um, detritus floating out over the sea and still function in that way. Uh, but the plant detritus will sink as well as um, some of the uh, uh, kelp itself 
and it'll be sequestered in the deep sea. About 20 times more um, CO2 is absorbed per acre of coastline than a typical land forest. So that's an impressive statistic. I wasn't aware that it was nearly that high before. Uh, this is a, is a complex um, slide. You'll find it on Wikipedia if you look up carbon sequestering in the oceans. And uh, we'll take a few more minutes with this one. Much of our oceanic carbon is consumed by krill, which is a type of zooplankton. If you can follow my arrow, it's right up there at the level of the surface of the ocean. And um, large phytoplankton are eaten by zooplankton. And of course, krill is one of the major forms of zooplankton. Um, and so you can see these arrows uh, pretty dynamically here. And the key point is aggregate formation. And these will gradually sink. Um, there's a word here that you may have seen before, and I noticed it right away when I was looking at it, archaea. And uh, I remember reading about those organisms back in, um, oh, 40 years ago or so. Um, I think it was around 1977, it was first discovered that um, these existed in the, in the mid-Atlantic ridge in these uh, uh, chimneys, volcanic chimneys, very, very hot magma escaping through the separating plates uh, south of uh, Iceland in the mid-Atlantic ridge. And these were thought to be thermophilic um, organisms. Um, and I think most of us just associated it with that sort of rare occurrence. And then I heard about them in Yellowstone Park, where of course they're very hot springs and that would make sense. And I thought that was about all. And so I looked at it here and I thought, well, what's so hot about that? And so I looked it up and realized that uh, in the last 40 years, we found that archaea are a very major uh, life form, uh, not the same as bacteria because their cell well structures are a little different. They have also some differences in their RNA structure, uh, but um, they have four major groups um, and they exist in all of us in our colons and they do a lot of methane production in our colon. So we can uh, attribute um, um, our passing gas, as we sometimes call it, to the archaea that we have in our own bodies. They're really quite widely distributed through nature, a little more sophisticated in their uh, anatomy than bacteria and are thought to possibly be a, a midpoint in the transition from an evolutionary transition from prokaryotes to eukaryotes. So I thought it was interesting to find them here uh, in this uh, part of the, of the, along with bacteria over here in the gradual uh, um, deposition of carbon and sinking into the sediment. So this is how we got our, uh, how the oil and natural gas as we call it uh, became sedimented in, in, in these uh, bottoms of the oceans and uh, why we go doing offshore um, digging through the Gulf of Mexico and the North Sea and many other places, because that's a, a very good potential source of it. Um, but uh, as I passed out to you a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, it was also a um, diabolical uh, uh, decision that we made to um, dig these things up because it, we as uh, humans have changed the planet considerably and are continuing to do so with no sign of, of our changing it much, even though we talk about it a lot. So, uh, um, but it's still going down all the time and being uh, collected for the future. Um, so moving on to the next slide, we'll try and elaborate on this a little bit more. This is a little simpler chart showing again the phytoplankton a little bit um, better visualization, the zooplankton uh, here. And, um, uh, and then after grazing on the phytoplankton, the uh, krill in particular, but most of the zooplankton are big poopers. And, and this uh, uh, collects with uh, uh, the decaying phytoplankton and uh, 
continues to go down to the deep ocean floor. Um, organic matter, um, we need to understand a little bit about the size of it. It has quite some range. Um, if you take a centimeter over in the extreme right here and a millimeter and work your way down to a micron, and then you go up to about seven microns about here, that's the size of a red blood cell. So it gives you an idea of the relative size. Phytoplankton can be pico, nano, or, or micro, zooplankton, micro, meso, or macro, and so on. Um, but uh, um, oceanic carbon production accounts for half of the carbon fixation, fixation carried out on the earth. And 80% of that half occurs over the open ocean. So we think of it as a, as a sterile uh, part in the, the coast more important, but um, the uh, sedimentation takes place um, all across the deep ocean. And this was kind of interesting to me, and I, I hope to you too. I've, I've uh, found this figure of the five families of phytoplankton. Um, and I put their names over the top of these figures so that we can relate. Cyanobacteria are also called blue-green algae. Uh, I think it's a bit confusing to think of a bacteria and an algae as uh, synonyms, but in this particular case, uh, they seem to be. And they're single-celled um, blue-green algae that are um, got this curious name, cyanobacteria. And uh, they do emit a toxin, sometimes a hepatotoxin or sometimes a neurotoxin. Uh, in some of the lakes and ponds that are not uh, well um, flushed out and can accumulate and be dangerous for swimmers. And you may hear about the term cyanobacteria or more often blue-green algae and associated with there. Diatoms we'll see pictures of in a little bit, dinoflagellates, fascinating little creatures, uh, green algae and coccolithophores was the picture that I showed you before. And this is really quite incredible when you think of the white cliffs of Dover. Uh, these cliffs are 300 feet tall, made almost entirely from the plates of buried coccolithophores. So for those of you who've seen the white cliffs of Dover, or even these, this picture here, it's pretty impressive that those are made up from these uh, uh, buried coccolithophores of the ocean. And here are the dinoflagellates. It's a complex family of phytoplankton. They look ready for battle uh, with all these projections. Uh, they're unicellular, but they often grow in colonies. And um, uh, we're still looking at their DNA and trying to understand them better. Um, diatoms are incredible. Um, the different shapes that they can have, some quite symmetrical like this. Um, there's a, a woman at the uh, Dalhousie University in Halifax, Catalina Albury, who is uh, uh, culturing diatoms. Her master's thesis was about my vitamin B12 deficient ones, uh, but they're looking into cold adapted diatoms and see how they might survive in warmer waters. She plans to study acidification effects as well, and I think that might be quite interesting. Uh, these are some of her slides from her talk. Um, she, this was a pictorial, a uh, thing, not an actual image of the huge uh, variable morphology that diatoms can have. They grow in both polar seas, um, in particular, uh, that thrive in the larger, larger numbers in the Southern Ocean where the sequestered carbon. Um, so you see quite a morphologic variation. Here they are actually in culture, um, uh, close up. We're learning about the effects of altering this is a quote from her um, of altering the temperature and acidity and the ability of phytoplankton to thrive. And you can do this much more easily in culture. And so she's um, having a lot of fun with that. Uh, now, zooplankton, these are the microscopic animals of the sea. And they include krill, which we've, uh, we'll talk about in a minute, miniature sea snails, pelagic worms, and um, there's a copepod shown here. I don't know if any of you have ever looked at a copepod under a microscope of pond water, but I had the pleasure of doing that somewhere early on in my 
schooling, I was just fascinated by this little cyclops looking thing with the two antennae, which sort of drive it around as well as the uh, caudal setae. And these things squirm around in the pond water. I, I just couldn't believe that they were so plentiful and so active um, and uh, really quite fascinating little copepods. Um, most of them, anything that's called plankton are generally weak swimmers. So this would be probably one of the more active of the um, uh, swimmers in the zooplankton. Some of them are little mini jellyfish and they can't swim very much. Um, so the word plankton, of course, means they're wanderers. They're carried by the currents of the ocean and eaten by larger animals or by each other. I, I find this, this photo fascinating. I'm not sure how it was taken or any details, but we'll see some pictures later of photographers underwater and I imagine they took these. It's an incredible photograph of these uh, krill. Um, they're most prolific in the Southern Ocean. They accumulate in clouds up to 30,000 per cubic meter. Um, they gorge on phytoplankton. And as I mentioned, they're sloppy eaters and big poopers, so they add much digested carbon to sequester in the deep uh, sea sediments. Uh, here's another photograph of one that is a bit uh, bioluminescent. You can see some bioluminescence in the body. And uh, the green uh, longitudinal thing here is some bioluminescence left in the, in the feces. And here in some saliva or spit that's emitted from the the front end. Um, so they're about um, up to six centimeters long, um, not all of them that long. They weigh up to a couple of grams and they can live for up to six years. And uh, they are, in terms of biomass, one of the most abundant animal species on the planet. They also have an interesting life cycle. They spawn in uh, January to March, which would be the summer in the Antarctic. Females lay about 8,000 eggs fertilized near the surface. And these, uh, you can see here, uh, slowly sink to the shelf of uh, the land, whatever land there is below. And, um, or they may, if they're offshore, they may just fall down to great depths. Eventually they hatch. And then the, as they molt through various larval stages, developing more legs and compound eyes and so on uh, as they shed cutting this exoskeleton every two to three weeks and they mature over two to three years. And here is their distribution in the Southern Ocean. You can see the tip of South America here on the left and right next to it, what they call the Antarctic Peninsula. And most of the studies have been done in this area, uh, which I'll show you a little bit later. Here, of course, the uh, um, South Africa, here Australia, and here New Zealand. Uh, there's an east wind which causes large eddies and the krill swarm together, moving deeper nutrients upward as they sink and they sequester carbon dioxide then uh, to the floor. I mentioned that they're a keystone piece species and food for whale, squid, and even albatross. Now, this is the area I was referring to before, and I'm going to focus just on that little area there. Uh, there's an island called Adelaide just offshore, and they study that island over a period of, of uh, 20 years or so, and saw a, a tendency for the density in the number per square meter here, not cubic meter, so they were using an area um, for a, perhaps a given depth, but they noticed a decline in the concentration of krill over that 20 year period. They made some other studies too, and I don't have the data for those. But so I don't think we have conclusive uh, information on the frequency of krill, but they are um, um, maybe having some challenges as a result of perhaps um, some massive fishing. I've mentioned to you before that the, the um, uh, not the Sierra Club, but another group, forgetting the name at the moment, uh, are very active in um, um, protecting the Southern Oceans and they will occasionally um, 
um, challenge other ocean factory ships and make sure that they're doing fish legal fishing. And uh, I think that is might be helping at least our, uh, our krill densities. Uh, this is a long-term decline published uh, the paper from Cambridge showing a picture of the area and this comment uh, that uh, when there's a decline in krill stock, you get an increase in salps. I was wondering what on earth are salps and uh, why they have this inverse relationship with krill. Well, this is what a salp is like. They're also called sea grapes and they're a tunicate. A tunicate is a, has a, um, a cord, um, so it's, but it's not a vertebra in, in a particular early form of its life. But it's a barrel shaped planktic tunicate moves through the water by contracting or pumping water through its gelatinous body. So it's different than a jelly because there are holes at each end, it's tunnel shaped. And so the, uh, uh, the water can go through in one end and out the other, rather much more better swimmer than a jelly. And they frequent all seas singly or in long stringy colonies, but they are most abundant in the Southern Ocean and especially when the krill populations decrease. Beyond that, I don't have much information on them, but I'd never heard of the word before until I started reading up about krill. And I thought it was sort of interesting, this inverse relationship. This is a, an, an image of some divers who have been under the sea ice, fairly shallow sea ice, so there's uh, probably thin, I should say, sea ice, so that the uh, you can see the photosynthesis of the phytoplankton greening up the ice. And you can also see uh, this diver is very well clothed and uh, has a camera. He's got a little loop around a line so that he won't get lost under the ice and taking some amazing photographs. I'm including one of them here because it's just, I thought, so stunning. <coughs> There's something about that picture that I find just intriguing. It's um, mysterious and tantalizingly uh raises questions about light and ice and extent and uh just a intriguing almost like abstract art but but fascinating to look at moving on these are the close-ups of the krill feeding under the polar ice and this one happens to be a little closer to the photographer he's a little farther away and you can actually see them feeding you don't see the green here the phytoplankton but they're they're there and the the krill are uh, hungrily feeding on them. Um, that's their favorite place to be. And you can, uh, in this laboratory study, they have uh, petri dishes on ice and they're selecting various types that they want to experiment with in terms of their genetics, their breeding, their sensitivity to uh, pH and all those things. Uh, so that's ongoing and I'm glad to see it happening. Whales, of course, uh, eat a lot of krill, as we know, when they, when they um, come up to the surface. The blue whale, the Earth's largest animal, consumes 35,000 pounds. That would be about 17 tons of krill every day. Uh, and they did a study of 321 of these um, uh, whales in three oceans. And by eating such large quantities of them and then defecating, the whales release iron it's locked within the krill back into the ocean, making it available to the phytoplankton that need iron to survive. So the, <clears throat> there's an iron cycle as well as a carbon cycle. And um, uh, there's a balance, a beautiful balance that's existed for years. And the whales are coming back to more reasonable numbers now. I'll show you a slide later of their relative uh, numbers and uh, endangerment. For now, let's go to the ocean's pH. Uh, we've talked about pH before. The ocean is slightly basic. I like this slide because it shows neutral in the middle and it shows these things that we're all familiar with. Uh, blood is fairly close to neutral, a little bit on the alkaline side of seven. Uh, Seawater is, uh, this is a really important one, 8.0 to 8.2. Uh, matcha tea is sort of a, Popular tea, it's a little more alkaline yet. Going the other direction, cow's milk, I never think of it as being mildly acidic, but it's very, very mildly so, 6.7 to 6.9. And of course, lemon juice getting down into the four range. Um, 
what's interesting is that we uh, evolved from from the oceans and uh, uh, at a time the ocean was um, um, 8.2 but now it's getting down to 8.1 they say when it becomes 8.0 <coughs> excuse me it will be uh, much more precarious and 7.9 could lead to a lot of loss of uh, phytoplankton and krill so uh, our industrial revolution is not only warming the planet, but acidifying the oceans. And um, uh, it's 30% more acidic than it was in pre-industrial times. And so uh, we need to keep that in mind as well as the temperatures. This uh, slide is, a, is an interesting one, it comes from the American Academy of Sciences and they had a special uh, publication on this after a major meeting. And I just downloaded some of the notes. It's quite complicated, but I think worth taking a little time on. There are six ways to help mother nature. They talk about, we'll walk through them a little bit. Uh, ocean alkalinity enhancement is up here. Basically, uh, this means either putting alkali directly into the oceans, which is what Alex Canara has been recommending, or sometimes much more complex um, um, uh, chemical studies, which are more expensive and I think hard to to scale up, but but there's a we'll elaborate a little bit more on that. Then there's nutrient fertilization, and this often I think is more related to as a nutrient to the iron. People have tried to to put iron in a soluble fashion into the oceans, <coughs> excuse me, to see if they could increase the abundance of uh, uh, microscopic life uh, nearby. And um, I don't, these are dangerous things to do on a large scale. So they've been done on a research uh, level. And um, I don't, I haven't heard of anything very positive about that. Um, I don't know of any plans where it's gonna be done on a larger scale. Seaweed cultivation might be a little bit challenging to do. They're thinking about kelp here, obviously. And kelp is a wonderful thing. We should definitely um, encourage it. Um, and I'll have a nice slide about it in a few minutes about natural ways that we can encourage it as opposed to hanging it out on a, on a floating lines. I'm not so sure how practical that is, but it might be worth considering. Uh, ecosystem recovery, I think mostly relates to marine sanctuaries. So for natural um, methods of recovery. Artificial upwelling and downwelling, sort of a physical means of providing vertical movement here. I'm not sure how practical that is, but that's being considered. And then the last one, electrochemical um, uh, CO2 storage, that is uh, taking in the CO2 and uh, changing it in some way so that it can be more stably stored or possibly even not changing it, but just putting it uh, most deeply into um, Ma um, not magma, but uh, basalt. And this is what they've been doing in Iceland, for example, um, where they uh, uh, use geothermal energy, which is very plentiful. And um, uh, they can therefore uh, collect and purify this CO2 and then out of the air, for example, and then where it's not in very high concentrations and then pump it down and it will actually chemically combine with basalt. And um, uh, so that, and they've tested that and shown that it is stable. So that's um, an interesting approach, but again, difficult to scale up and fairly expensive. Um, so I'll touch on some of their tables. It may be a little overwhelming, but I'll just try and catch the high points so we don't spend too much time on it. Uh, this is a, one of two tables, a uh, summary of the CDR, and this is carbon dioxide removal. And it's, you, we're talking here about the scale up potential and we're looking at knowledge base and efficacy. And they're scaled, the, the six different things that we just talked about are scaled by whether they're medium or high knowledge base. Uh, we don't know too much about the artificial upwelling, how well it's gonna work. A little bit more, we have knowledge on, on seaweed cultivation not quite so much on ecosystem recovery, uh, alkalinity enhancement. We're not too knowledgeable on that yet. 
And uh, efficacy is a, perhaps a more important one. And uh, I thought this was interesting. The only one has a high confidence is uh, the ocean alkalinity enhancement that the Canara has been talking about. And here, uh, electrochemical processes, but I worry about scalability there. In any case, uh, people are thinking about it and they're very concerned about doing something which would backfire. And so the, the, in the next slide, we look at this environmental risk aspect and evaluate these six things that we just saw. And notice the only one that's fairly low is ecosystem recovery. And again, uh, this is something that you hear a lot from Sylvia Earle and others who are interested in the marine biologists who want to have marine sanctuaries. And um, uh, there is uh, not much risk to that if we can um, uh, have those patrolled. With new transponders being required on ships today, I'll show you an interesting slide showing how nicely uh, that can work to try and prevent um, uh, invasion by um, uh, illegal fishing boats into marine sanctuaries. So it's an interesting one. But anyway, there it's all there. And if you want, well, this of course will be uh, recorded, is being recorded, and you can look at these in more detail later. I don't think we have time to read all of this, but it's, it at least introduces you to the idea of, of a thorough study by the American Academy. This is just a little blow up of what was also taken from that same report uh, showing um, uh, the various uh, uh, changes, trophic cascades of carbon and deadfall carbon and so on. Here, the idea of Canaras uh, to mine in his case, he wanted to use uh, calcium carbonate, lots of limestone around, and find a way that you could grind it up and, and um, process it so that the CO2 that's released from heating it up, uh, there's huge amounts of CO2 released, so you have to capture that. And then as lime, it can be put on ships and then uh, put in the ocean here uh, and uh, see if we can keep the oceans from acidifying more. So these are steps and potential impacts of alkalinity enhancement in coastal regions. Uh, so they're thinking about it, but uh, we're doing a lots of thinking before we start it. And uh, let's hope we don't think too long and, and make sure that we can do it safely and effectively. Um, so these are some concluding remarks from the American Academy. They say that uh, carbon dioxide removal approaches are being discussed widely, in some cases promoted by scientists, entrepreneurs, etc. cetera. Um, society and policymakers lack sufficient knowledge to fully evaluate CDR outcomes and weigh the trade-offs. Um, research on uh, oceanic CDR therefore is needed, more research to decide whether or not society moves ahead with deployment and to assess at what scales and locations uh, they should be uh, applied. Okay, we'll switch now from uh, the topic of carbon dioxide removal and just think for a moment, a few moments about switching uh, our ideas to the coral reefs, quite a different issue, um, and, uh, but still very important. Uh, why should we protect coral diversity? Well, they're building blocks, of course, of coral reefs. They're among the most diverse ecosystems on the planet. And, um, uh, healthy coral reefs are crucial for the survival of more than a quarter of marine life, and yet they occupy less than a tenth of the ocean area. Every day, uh, over a billion people worldwide are dependent on healthy coral for their survival of people who live in, in the tropical oceans. Uh, without coral diversity, reefs will struggle to, uh, to support uh, this, this dependence. Um, this is an example of a, a research done by Luisa Fontura. She first arrived in Australia's Macquarie University five years ago to begin her PhD. And it was just after the Great Barrier Reef suffered massive coral bleaching in the summer of 2016. And so she worked on the hard hit Lizard Island and she was confronted by the stark contrast uh, between her colleagues, amazing memories of the reef and its current diminished state. So this is what it was like, I think before she even got there. And uh, it's a pretty impressive image there of corals. And uh, you see it a bit later, it's uh, really changed. Six years and a doctorate later, Fontura is working on better understanding of connections 
between the world's coral reefs in order to give them their best shot at survival. She's a lead author in a study published in science that shows that 70% of the reefs linked by ecologically vital movement of fish larvae remain unprotected. Her theory is that a reef, just like a forest in our own uh, lands, they need to be connected so that um, uh, wildlife can travel from one to another. The same applies apparently in her, in her research to reefs. If they're too isolated, um, they, they do not thrive. They need the interaction of uh, movement from one reef to the next. And this apparently is a very essential part of the thriving of reefs in our oceans. So they not only need to have the pH protected, but they need to be, uh, allow the emission and acceptance of uh, migrants. Um, so uh, the Great Barrier Reef has experienced three mass coral bleaching events in the last five years, and over 50% of the coral cover is already gone. Worldwide, every coral reef region has been impacted by bleaching and some beyond repair. Each time there's additional bleaching, we risk losing the most vulnerable corals or reefs. Uh, the bleaching happens as a result of um, uh, thermal um, damage to the organisms inside the, the cylindrates. They're generally uh, uh, algae, different types of algae, and they can uh, go for a short time. You have a certain thermal tolerance built up and there can be recovery and you can get about three recoveries or so before uh, the algae just give up and quit. And then you have this ghost of the uh, uh, calcareous remains of the coral. Um, and so it's important to heed the warning side of bleaching because three bleaches and you're out, maybe sort of like baseball. Um, we also need to really protect our kelp. Um, you can see some different species of kelp in the different colors here, but notice uh, where they're occurring in relation to where we live. Um, Santa Monica, California seems to be a center where they're studying them a lot uh, up and down this west coast. A lot of uh, kelp here as well um, along the northeast coast and some parts of Europe, Asia, Australia, South Africa, and South America. So. Um, first time I ever put an aqualung on was here in the Straits of Juan de Fuca. And I was working in a cannery for that summer studying the salmon. And um, I put on an aqualung and I went into the water and it was just, just stunning, stunning impression to swim through those kelp forests. I got a little cold though. And uh, I came up and realized afterwards that it was 46 degrees. So I went, went up and bought a wetsuit soon after that so I could enjoy it a little more without freezing. Well, these kelp are unique. They're affected by urchins, sea urchins. This is a whole fast anchor and it's important that it be strong. And our sea otter friends that we're also fond of, of uh, observing uh, do eat sea urchins. They come down and they keep them under control. But if sea otters are absent, uh, there's an explosion of a sea urchin population and therefore you end up with overgrazed kelp. Uh, they just don't uh, um, do nearly so well if there are too many sea urchins around. The sea urchins are, uh, I guess, grazing directly on the kelp. And um, um, it reminds me a little bit of the story of the getting rid of the wolves in Yellowstone Park. Uh, you need to maintain these balances in the sea as well as or in the coastal regions as well as in our parks. Just a review here of the oceanic plant so that we can try and put it all together in, a, in, in our minds. So kelp is a type of algae, but not a true plant. It has more than one tissue with a little more complex um, uh, type of um, algae. Seagrass is the only flowering plant in the oceans that has evolved from land. Sargassum is a brown seaweed with little air bladders and it floats in big masses and so you of the Sargassum Sea out in the uh, south mid-Atlantic, um, sort of mid-Atlantic a bit. Um, phytoplankton we've talked about, we know uh, now a bit more about these photosynthetic self-feeding organisms. Uh, red algae are popular edible plants eaten in Korea, Japan, and China. And then the blue-green algae also cause cyanobacteria that can be toxic if swallowed. So those are some examples of 
six oceanic plants that uh, we need to sort of keep straight. Now I'd promised you this slide. This is one of my favorite areas of the world, the Galapagos Islands. And you can see there are a couple of bright spots where ships that have uh, uh, presumably tour, tour ships uh, that are not fishing, but they have these transponders to let uh, the people know through the fast satellite networks that we have that they're there on legitimate business. I'm not sure about these strings. I don't imagine there's any fishing allowed, but I, I, I don't know why there's so many of these here. But look at all of these global fishing uh, guys uh, outside. They call us Chinese factoring ship, factory ships the circle sanctuaries because there's pretty good food there, but at least they know they can't legally enter. And uh, this new edition of transponders, which is required not only on airplanes today, but on all airplanes now need uh, transponders except for ultralights. And um, similarly, all ships now need them and they can be controlled from space. As you know, uh, uh, there's a great a lot of communication satellites going up. Um, in some respects, one worries about the number of them, but uh, at least they may help us to, to control um, our, our oceans and uh, restrict and protect the marine protected areas. Uh, we've all heard about plastic and can't uh, say enough about avoiding this. Uh, this poor whale shark is gonna have our little problem in its mouth before long in that picture. I promised to tell you a wee bit about whales. Uh, there are nine whales here. I've mentioned the orcas, they're top predators, and there are some populations not doing so well, but other populations are thriving. Uh, but these are the other nine ones that we commonly hear about. And I think it's an interesting table because it shows us the endangered species in vertical column there, the blue, the right, and the humpback. These have been popular for years for um, oil, before we found oil that we could dig out of the bottom of the ocean, uh, we used whale oil for a lot of things, illumination and lubrication. And those uh, species have recovered a lot, but they're still endangered. Uh, vulnerable, but not quite so endangered are the gray whale, sperm whale, and fin whale, and not threatened to any significant degree, the minke whale, the narwhal, and the beluga. These are much smaller and, um, uh, Fortunately, not so threatened. So coming to the essence of the talk, we have six wedges. We must tackle all six of them together to restore health and abundance to the ocean in the next 30 years. Uh, this is our, our vetting criteria that helps us determine where and how to focus our time and resources. But we need to protect the spaces, of course, uh, uh, new marine protected areas and use our influence to build constituencies of support. We need to protect the species of fish and uh, uh, other creatures of the seas. Um, no species is too small to matter. We need to stop our pollution, not only of plastics, but of oil spills, uh, every kind of pollution, the fertilizers and so on that um, uh, we put in the oceans. We need to rethink our fisheries, um, reframe our sea creatures. We've talked about uh, that in previous sessions. I gave a talk called Future Ocean uh, by a woman who had very idealistic views, but I think they were uh, valid ones um, about uh, our fisheries. We need to restore the habitats, um, particularly the uh, coral reefs and mangrove forests, uh, kelp forests, and oyster beds. Oyster beds are really important, not only for those of us who like to eat them, but also they're great filter feeders and help to clean up the ocean. Uh, we need to, most of all, uh, not overlook a, a climate change because 70% uh, of the planet is covered by oceans and they've given the planet a lot of resilience, and soaked up a lot of the CO2, uh, but that resilience is, coming to a limit now as our oceans start to turn more and more uh, less alkaline and more and more acidic. And so this is really important for um, the future of the oceans. So just a, a couple of final pictures. This is a, an image from um, Sylvia Earle emphasizing how blue our planet is. She's 
taken it where you can barely see uh, South America on one side and, and Asia and Australia on the other, and just to see the enormity of the Pacific Ocean. Uh, this one showing also the Pacific, but some of the hot spots and um, uh, how differences of uh, half a degree, um, it's a bit of exaggerated with this color scheme, but there are some hot spots by an extra plus three or four degrees here. Uh, they've noticed in um, this period of uh, 2019 to 2021. So it seems to be uh, warming in certain spots more than others. Now, I wanted to invite Amanda Vincent. She is a, uh, has a PhD and is now a marine biologist at the University of British Columbia. Uh, she loves seahorses and so do I. And I thought that it would be great to have her as our guest speaker, but I was not able to reach her. I think she's too busy doing other things, but I did uh, see an interview see her being interviewed, I should say, by um, Sylvia Earle in her Ocean Elders series that she does on Thursday afternoons. And so I took a few of these slides. Um, these are, of course, are the typical uh, seahorses that we see. Uh, this is a very disguised one. It looked just like some of the material that it's hiding in. Uh, this is a male expelling its little babies. As you know, they, they um, um, males take care of the of the um, fertilized ova and um, assume the role of, of pregnancy for a period of time before these little baby seahorses come out and the different sizes and shapes and how they disguise themselves with these little appendages or colors so that they are harder to detect. Um, lovely little creatures. Her big point is she's bothered by bottom trawlers. Uh, she says, uh, this is a typical catch on a night and you see only one tiny little seahorse in there and you think, well, that's okay. Uh, it's all bycatch, lots of little crayfish and uh, other little things in there. But she, the next line, she points out that the total catch is over 11 million seahorses per year uh, from the first 21 countries they surveyed. Um, so uh, that's a lot of seahorses, 11 million in there. Uh, I know a year is a long time, but still, uh, they are gradually being decimated faster than they can reproduce. And um, uh, she's really bothered by bottom trawlers. Uh, we'll go into a few more details about that. This is what they haul up in the nets. She says it obliterates marine wildlife, destroys their habitat on a huge scale, uh, undermines food security, and they don't even make money uh, often. They just grind them up for, for uh, food, uh, mostly fish food for farmed fish. Uh, she said it depends on subsidies. It can harm people. And um, um, she's very um, bothered by these bottom trawlers. So she says, use your vote, ask government and industry to act to avoid it. Um, she says uh, solutions to, um, to this is simply reduce the trawled area, implement existing laws, ban bottom trawling on all marine protected areas, of course. We must, uh, as we grow to 30% ocean protection by 2030, one of the things we keep linking 30 to other convenient numbers to get us motivated. Uh, and we need to exclude bottom trawling to do that. Um, this is an example of the bottom trawlers racing to their prey as their um, the opening day of a particular fish farming uh, begins, and not farming, but trawling, I mean. This is a side view of the net. Here is the net here, and you can see these gates on each side to help sweep uh, anything that's floating uh, into the center of this net. And uh, another picture here shows, uh, I don't know how she could get ocean clear enough to get this photograph, but you're looking down at four of these nets in uh, parallel. Uh, churning up and, and ruining uh, the ocean bottoms. Uh, also, we shouldn't forget about seafloor nodules. You know, everybody is concerned about cobalt and manganese in our lithium batteries. And these things uh, don't look too bad, uh, but if you use uh, these horrible uh, trawling methods, you're going to destroy an awful lot of the ocean bed. It turns out that there are shark teeth 
and other uh, small bony collections um, upon which um, copper and manganese tend to accumulate over hundreds of years, I suppose. And these things are lying in swaths across the ocean. In particular, there's a swath that begins at its western end, just south of Hawaii, and extends toward Mexico. And uh, they want to get permission to gather these nodules. Uh, what I find really scary is that the machine that they're planning to use to do this. These are two guys dressed in red suits working on them. They caught Patania one and they didn't think it was quite good enough. So they came up with number two and it's even worse. Uh, but it, they plan it to, to collect manganese nodules at full ocean depth. Uh, so this is on the wings and um, we need to think twice before, more than think twice, uh, before stopping these things from destroying our ocean bottoms that could be even worse than, um, than the sea trawling. So fortunately we have a thing called Convention on International Trade for Endangered Species called CITES. And um, uh, that's uh, helping us, but we need much more and um, to protect our oceans. So I'm going to, I haven't been paying any attention <laughs> to, uh, uh, right here, let's see. Let me just stop the slide share so I can see what's going on here and see if we have any people in the chat function. We have 12 attendees today and um, thanks all for coming. Uh, let's see what we have in the chat. Don't see anything yet. Hi, Richard. Somebody said, "Ah, it looks like only panelists can see the chat. So we better go to the." That's too bad. Um, Q and A is only available to the to us. Let's see if we have. So close. Hmm. That's a funny thing. Why don't you raise your hand? Maybe that way I can, if you'd like to uh, raise your hand, I might be able to see you and so that we could have any feedback. Because I have great faith in this group that uh, Q&A isn't working. We had, I tested this with Stephanie beforehand and it seemed to be working. Uh, not getting anything. I see one hand up, not quite sure where yet. Uh, if you want to unmute yourself, I don't know if you can, but feel free to speak up. Dorothy says, how can the public influence ocean mining and bottom trawling practices? Um, that's a good question. And I think um, our main influence can be the organizations that we support. Um, I personally uh, support both the Nature Conservancy and the Ocean Conservancy. I think I give about 10 times more to the Ocean Conservancy than the Nature Conservancy, not wanting to knock the ladder. It's a very fine organization, uh, but that's one way uh, because uh, I've, I've watched there, I get their publications and I think they work very efficiently uh, and would uh, of course help with the uh, ocean mining and bottom trawling, but that's a good question. Uh, beyond that, um, I think it would require that we get to know um, people on the various organizations uh, that make laws. There, there's the, uh, there's, there are large and important international oceanic organizations and um, that would involve more research on our part to get to know them. But I'm sure that most of them are as concerned as we are and they're doing their best. Um, to answer your question a little bit more, uh, Dottie, uh, uh, there was a, an editorial last Friday in Science Magazine. And there were three people who 
wrote about a international organization where they were looking into biodiversity of the oceans. And they invited to this table a wealthy uh, uh, entrepreneur from Australia who was designing that machine that I just showed you in the last slide. That's how I heard about it. And I was so horrified that I wrote a letter to all three of the writers of the editorial last Friday and uh, objected that they even admitted the guy to the table. I didn't think he should have a, an, even a, an opening uh, to, maybe they sh certainly shouldn't even be there, I, I don't think, to um, talk seriously about biodiversity. How can you talk about biodiversity in, in this horrible um, science fiction scary machine uh, dredging up these uh, nodules. There's just no need to, uh, just because um, parts of West Africa where they mine cobalt uh, have children working in them, it's no reason in itself to stop using cobalt from mines. Uh, there's cobalt in Canada, there's cobalt in a number of parts of the world. I don't think that it justifies um, uh, going after ocean bottom. So I think people like this need to be educated and, and this guy seemed to think he could make this machine and make a lot of money off of these nodules. But uh, I was appalled that they even allowed him to, to have a voice at this meeting. And uh, maybe I was a little too upset, but I, I haven't had any feedback from them. There's another question um, from Don Reeder. Um, let's see here. What are dead zones off the coast of Louisiana? Um, you probably know as well as I do, Don, but uh, uh, the number of oil wells uh, or wells dug for the harvest of oil is um, very large. If you look at maps, and I think I give a talk about uh, uh, Deepwater Horizon um, a few years ago, and went through the details of that in the 20, the 10 years it's taken since for only partial recovery of the disaster there. Um, it's just appalling the number of wells that have been dug there. And as they get deeper and deeper, they get more and more dangerous. As you recall, during the Obama administration, uh, he was wringing his hands because it took, I think, over a month to plug uh, this Deepwater Horizon um, well. It was just uh, spewing oil in vast amounts. Now, in places like um, those dead zones that, that Don is talking about, um, there is a, a seep going on continuously. Uh, when we talked about um, the carbon deposition, there is so much carbon that's been deposited in the Gulf of Mexico coming down the Mississippi and just in the natural way that the Gulf of Mexico uh, uh, exists, its geography, there is an awful lot of carbon and which is uh, gradually um, decayed down to uh, smaller and smaller um, hydrocarbons. And so that there can be drilled out. And some of them, before you even try and drill them out, they're, they're just seeping oil naturally out of the ocean floor. So all of those things, to a certain degree, there's been a, a natural um, evolution of, um, cleansing by the movements of the ocean to keep it uh, a certain balance, an equilibrium. But uh, with all the oil wells that have been dug, uh, most of them, I imagine, have been capped, but not once they've, once they've finished harvesting the oil in those wells, but uh, there are always some amount of leaks and we don't know, there's no good way to to see how much they're leaking. We have to depend on the oil industry to be their own. They obviously want to conserve the oil themselves for their uh, refining, but uh, there, there has to be considerable amount of oil that's spilled. And I understand uh, some recent reading that um, um, it's, it's still a long way after, uh, I think it's 12 years now, a long way from, uh, healing itself and from all the attempts we've made to clean it up.
So it's a, it was a major ecological disaster. But uh, the dead zone that you're referring to, I think, Don, is a, you might be referring to a more of a natural phenomenon. And I agree with you that that does exist. Um, a lot of, uh, of uh, industrial waste has come down the Mississippi over the past hundred years and, uh, and contributes to a dead zone um, that's uh, in the, in the, uh, along the coast of Louisiana. And so Dorothy asks a good question, are all dead zones associated with oil spills? And, and I've kind of answered that just now by, by mentioning that uh, uh, some rivers uh, highly polluted bring down their own um, waste, industrial waste of all different sorts and um, uh, kill the, the, all the creatures along the sea bottom there. So it's not just oil spills, but they just uh, contribute to it more. We're at 11, but we've still got an hour. Let me ask a question to you. Um, I uh, would like you to think about uh, next spring. We've had a, a former member of the board of directors of the um, Plato organization, Paul Thompson. And he has informed me that um, Plato is working with SAIL. Um, SAIL is an organization for seniors uh, who want active but independent lives. And their office is right next door to Plato at Oakwood. And they would like to have our group uh, move back to a hybrid system where we encourage more participation, participation from residents of Oakwood, as well as the um, open system that we have for people um, who prefer to stay at home or who are out of town. And so um, they've, they've, I believe they've acquired a system called OWL, O-W-L, um, which is, is uh, very well adapted with multiple cameras that sit on the table in front of a group of people around a table and uh, project the slides up onto a local screen and so on. It's just a, a very slick way to provide good sound transmission and visual transmission to um, uh, people who want to enjoy the benefits of both a hybrid and a in online um, portrayal of, of information and ideas. And uh, Paul asked me if I was interested in it and I wrote back and said that I was, but um, um, I would like to invite you uh, listeners to uh, join with me and take over a, a lot of the administrative function that I've been doing for the past, um, I guess this is the 12th year. Um, I, I really need some, a lot more help and I'd like to, um, uh, I notice on other groups such as um, Global Affairs and the Media, I think is a group that meets on Wednesdays at uh, Lake at um, Capital Lakes. And uh, they have a, a hybrid system that works uh, fairly well. I don't think they have the OWL system, but they uh, uh, have three or four or five people working together as teams uh, to help do the various functions of administering. And I've been doing most of it now with some help from Tony, but <clears throat> Tony has been great really, but he uh, has some medical issues himself. So um, I guess I'm asking you to think about and let me know uh, by some, through some emails and some perhaps some discussions here if we can get the Q&A working better uh, to uh, uh, share our thoughts about how we might continue uh, planning our, our uh, pathways to a sustainable planet uh, because I don't feel comfortable um, carrying on quite the way I've been doing. I would really like to have help. I would like to be almost retire from this and participate now and again, but have uh, three or four others essentially run this, this uh, group. So I'm um, passing this along to you now at the beginning of this session. Thankful to all of the speakers coming up and uh, Tony in particular, who's giving a talk and, and invited two others. Um, and 
but I'd like to see some changes uh, between now and, and when we get started next spring in late February. So, uh, Don uh, asks another question here. Uh, what are the effects on the oxygen dissolved in the ocean? What are the effects on the oxygen dissolved in the ocean? It would be helpful if you could elaborate on your question a bit, Don. The effects of what on the ocean, on the oxygen? Are we talking about pH? Are you talking about temperature? Um, um, but basically, uh, we know that when we have high temperature lakes and so on, the the lakes become lose their oxygen, and we see that in Lake Mendota. Um, it was a good be a good question, Don, for you to ask to um, uh, Gretchen. She'll be speaking to us. On, um, October the 31st, Halloween. Uh, her topic is going to be um, climate variability and Wisconsin lake ice cover. And uh, she is also quite knowledgeable on um, some other aspects of uh, limnology and um, also some interesting organisms called ostracods, which are bioluminescent. And I've asked her, although she hasn't replied yet, if she would tell us a little bit about some of her research. So um, let's hold that question. And uh, if you can ask her on Halloween, that would be great. Stephen Shellen has a, a comment. He says, I swam the Great Barrier Reef as a tourist in 2006. It was very beautiful then and snorkeling kept you up near the surface and away from the coral. Our fees to do so prom promoted policing the preservation area we were allowed to access. A, long, a lifelong friend growing up and college roommate is a professor in Australia and we keep in touch. The change downward is not due to controlled tourism, but to pollution and shipping outside that area. Well, that's very interesting. I appreciate that, Stephen. Um, it makes sense to me. Uh, I don't think tourism is the biggest problem, especially most of the tourism to places like this that are precious. Uh, the guides are really observant and uh, strongly encouraged. And so there's a self, um, a, a mutual cooperation and interest uh, by tourists who go to uh, uh, reefs like this. Um, so I can quite imagine that the problem is much more uh, pollution and shipping outside the area. Uh, just inside that area, by the way, Stephen, you might know this, uh, there is a huge port uh, where uh, vast amounts of coal are loaded onto ships and exported around the world. Um, Australia doesn't burn an awful lot of coal, but they sure mine a lot of it and they export a lot of it right next or onshore at the same latitude and region as the Great Barrier Reef. So your point is well taken. I think the shipping outside of that area, actually between that area and the coastline of coal, um, uh, with all of the diesel uh, required to power those uh, coal ships are contributing as well as the general um, temperatures, uh, pretty warm there in the, the northern part of Australia. And I think they found that when they looked at the progression of bleaching uh, of the coral, that it was worse uh, at the upper part, upper third, where the temperature is a bit warmer and both the air temperatures and water temperatures. And as you went south toward more temperate regions, um, the bleaching was not as advanced and not, not as progressive. So clearly there's ocean temperature and pollution and shipping. I agree with you completely uh, in that area. Uh, Dorothy has a question. If we use OWL, will all speakers have to be physically present at Oakwood? Um, that's probably the case. As I saw the, the video, and I can uh, send anybody who would like to know more about it, the link that Paul sent to me, 
um, uh, there were people sitting around a table and um, computers and it was linked to the screen so that um, each one could speak independently, be seen easily and communicate verbally very nicely. And then you could have the screen interplay. So you didn't have to be fiddling around with uh, uh, the way we do here with uh, uh, share screen. And you know, it's uh, in this uh, owl thing, even the wallpaper was done with owls, <laughs> it was kind of cute. And um, they, uh, but you could go from speaker to speaker and the past, the previous speaker could be seen as well as the current speaker. So it was a very smooth transition uh, as you went from individual to individual in a discussion. And uh, I'm delighted that they, I'm pretty sure uh, Paul implied to me that we have the technology already. So, um, but they're thinking of not starting it until the spring. So we have a few months to get ready. And, um, uh, and I think the, the room would probably be um, at Oakwood. So it would start from there. Um, but the uh, people could interact very nicely um, online. So you might not be a speaker from, you, you might invite your speakers to come to Oakwood, but uh, it's possible that um, we have to look into it further, that speakers from out of town could uh, link in. Um, that would, we'd have to look into that further, but it's a good, good point. Thank you for that. Um, Any other thoughts or questions? I've um, uh, wanted to mention uh, a little bit about two weeks from today. We have a, a, a trip, a field trip to the Holy Wisdom Monastery. Um, we don't have the parking problem with that that we would have had if we had had a um, recycling plant visitation where they have very little parking. We still want to do that and I think Tony might help us to do that maybe in the, in the spring. But I kind of, because we were having some problems with carpooling and, and so on, uh, we kind of snuck this one in ahead of the, uh, of the uh, recycling plant. Um, I found a guy, Mark Hansen, who does not stay at the Holy Wisdom Monastery, but who helped in some of the architectural design. And uh, we were there about seven years ago, I think. And he has agreed to meet us there uh, on October the 10th at 10 o'clock and tell us about what they've accomplished. And I think something we'll be all be interested in is asking him, sure, you, you may have accomplished a lot, but how much more electricity do you use to run all those heat pumps? And how effective is the insulation and so on that they've used? Um, Mark has uh, indicated that he'd be glad to, to come there and meet us. And I need to email him again and firm up that date, but that's been a tentative agreement. In terms of getting there, um, you're welcome to drive there yourself. It's easy to, uh, I can give you the address ahead of time and put it in your GPS, but also we can meet at the southwest corner of the Target parking lot, very fairly close to the bank where we used to go. Um, and uh, a few of us could um, meet there with with cars and pick up a few others who'd rather leave their car there. Um, it's not very far uh, to the Holy Wisdom Monastery. It's on the way past, um, um, on the way north of Lake Mendota, past a major golf club, I'm forgetting the name of the golf club, but uh, it's not it's not very far. It's just west of Middleton on the County M Road. So um, we could either carpool to some degree, I'll certainly be willing to pick up a few people and um, uh, any others, maybe Tony would and um, maybe Mert, if you would, I'm not sure you're there today. Anybody else who would like to come along and provide some transportation, we could all move. But we didn't need to, to meet at about 9.20 and leave at 9.30. Um, it's about a half, probably a little less, but well, I'll have half an hour to drive there. Um, so, uh, 
any, I don't see any other comments. Next uh, week, I'll be talking about how to drive a nuclear reactor um, to plug for it myself. I'll show you a picture of it. It's uh, uh, written by Colin Tucker in write up at the top. He's a Welshman who has been um, uh, running for 35 or 40 years a nuclear plant um, in England. And he uh, specializes in teaching and safety. And so his uh, book was motivated because he knew somebody who had uh, small steam engines for transportation and wrote a book about it. And it was appealing and interesting. He thought he would apply the same idea to a nuclear plant. And I think it came across quite well. So uh, it's um, a little bit more of an upbeat thing that tells us some details about reactors and the successes and the need for um, safety and how this is achieved. Uh, so it, I thought it would be a, um, a pleasant, upbeat, and not extremely complicated uh, talk. But I will talk a little bit about um, neutrons and protons and the various nuclei and isotopes, but I won't go too far into it, just enough to um, indicate that we do have some interesting ways to monitor the chain reaction so that we can tell by the accumulation of some isotopes uh, how fast the reaction is going. So it's just like having a speedometer in your car. And uh, that's nice to, to know how people who operate these plants work and keep them safe. So uh, when I say positive, I mean, uh, we focus so much on the negativity. Um, so that is our schedule for next um, Monday. Any other comments or questions? I appreciate all of them uh, that you've sent in folks and your comments and, and questions. And uh, don't hesitate to uh, send me some emails if you have other suggestions, thoughts in particular about next spring and uh, how we can form a group uh, to lead this uh, uh, fine group of interested people uh, to continuing information exchange. So um, almost 20 after 11. Again, no deadlines, but oh, Stephen has a comment. No, he did, we did, I already read that one. Thanks, Stephen. So I guess we're done and uh, have a great day and look forward to seeing you all next Monday. Hello. So